Hey, Broken Sales people. Welcome to the workshop. My name is Red Staffstrom, and we are here to help you fix your broken sales skills. Today, I have Natalie Jark, J-A-R-K. -J I, I did pronounce that right. It. I should have asked yes, that beforehand, right. but I didn't. <laughs> No, you're good. Like, like I thought, well, that's a simple one, but like, could it be a soft J like yogging, like that kind of thing? Like, I don't <laughs> I know. I know it looks really simple. It's only a four letter one. So yeah, but those right, are, though. those are just like deceptively easy sometimes. This is true. Um, so Natalie specializes in user experience, web design. She runs her own company. Um, and I, I know that you have a really great twist on that too, where you focus on companies who do good, like on... Yes. So I really want to get into everything with you, talk about your business, um, but that's pretty much the limit of the information that I have right now. So as always, as everybody knows, this is a brand new conversation for me as it is for everybody else who's listening. So I'm kind of excited about this. So awesome. why don't you give me the 90 second overview? Perfect. Well, thanks for having me on. And I'm so excited to be able to share with you today what I do because a lot of people look at a website and they don't really, they know that there's a lot that goes on behind it, but they don't really know the extent that it can get into these days with Google algorithm and all of that. So, um, you know, I essentially am a web design coach and consultant that specializes in user experience design and accessibility practices. So my aim is to help people do good online. And that means like creating in inclusive and accessible spaces online that literally anyone can engage with, no matter if they have a disability or if they, um, you know, have certain impairments that don't allow them to normally engage with websites. So I help them set themselves up for success. I started my business about two years ago um, when I left my full-time job to be a stay-at-home mom actually, and to actually, start my own business and kind of allow those creative juices to come out. And I, at the time I was just taking agency kind of work. I was working on things like interactive digital concierge boards that you'd see in a hotel that you can go up and tap and, you know, have an experience from. But I was also designing apps. I helped with SaaS platforms, software as a surface, um, service, sorry, and other websites. But after a while, I kind of realized that that's not really how I could do good in the world. And once COVID hit, I realized that my way to do good in the world was to help the small people, help the small businesses, you know, create engaging websites that get seen by Google and help them go out and do good in the world as well by promoting causes that they're passionate about. So that's where I landed. So, so like Natalie Jark as a freelancer business mm -hmm. has been around for two years, but the part where you specialize in websites for charities, people who work with, like I'm, what I'm hearing already is you focus on companies that work primarily with people with disabilities. Like that's yeah, probably so, your niche. Well, I create the, I help them create websites that will be able to be seen and engaged by people with disabilities. So when I'm designing something, I'm helping them look at color choices and text, texts and flows and things that a screen reader essentially could pick up on so that they can, you know, somebody who's blind, for instance, or has visual impairments can actually engage on your site. And not everybody always have that has that set up for success. No. And as somebody who has a I'm not full blown colorblind, but everything is a lot mm -hmm. grayer for me than most people are. And I think most men have that anyway. I think yes. like the statistic is like 80% of men are colorblind on some level. Yep. I have many friends who have some variation of colorblindness that are males. So it's yeah, it, like, I know it's more prevalent in males for colorblindness, but you do it with mm -hmm. people who have like, they're Hearing not impairments, visual impairments. Uh, they can't use their hands, you know, it, it's a spectrum of different yeah. things. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of different things that go into that. Mm -hmm. Yep, so, everything, it's crazy. It, I mean, it, it gets down to your copy and the way that the website flows and the way that the screen reader will read it. So it's, I get really passionate about it because there's so much that we can do to do good online. But uh, a lot of people just aren't doing it because they don't know about it. And, and it's so much more than just adding captions to the video so that the deaf people can actually understand what you're talking about. Yes. I mean, that is like the most entry, entry level of it. 
Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the part that people are aware of, right? But yes. people aren't aware of the back end things that you can do for your website to make sure that, you know, the visually impaired can see a button on your website and not be lost trying to add something to their cart or being lost trying to, um, you know, navigate the site because their screen reader isn't reading it out for them appropriately. Because I see that all the time, people who use these finer fonts, especially in the add to cart yeah. buttons and things like that, where from an aesthetic standpoint, if you can see, it looks great. It looks subtle. Mm -hmm. It's not this big blaring like idea of ah, buy this now. Yeah, but you know, that you seems know to be the trend. Away. Yes, you know, it's a trend to be very minimal, very, um, you know, thin lines and light colors and, you know, coming off very aesthetically pleasing. And yes, while that's so important, it's not going to all get, get seen and create an inclusive environment for everyone on the web. And if you're not, you're losing out on people, on your ideal client, your dream client, if they can't even engage with your website. So the, the demographic I'm thinking of right now is, especially when you're talking about no hands, not like mm -hmm. some visual issues. Um, I have some buddies who have come back from Iraq and Afghanistan who have mm -hmm. issues like this. And that's not something you always think about is because even yeah. targeting an ex-military crowd, mm -hmm. you think of them as the strong man. You think of them as, you know, mini Schwarzeneggers mm -hmm. and not, hey, there might have been an IED. Absolutely. Exactly. And, you know, they might be exactly who you want, but you have no idea if they're colorblind in some facet or if they've, like you said, had, you know, traumatic stress or, you know, any of those kinds of things. You just know that you need to create an experience for them to, you know, get them onto your website or engaging with it. And, and like, this is such a bigger field than I think people even realize, just going back through my own personal experiences, I remember knocking door to door with somebody who was legally blind. Yeah. And he was also a magician on the side, which, which <laughs> is a weird thing. Like he That's was fantastic. like an awesome magician, but he was also legally blind. So we would do things and he'd, but he'd have to print things out like Th mm -hmm. like three inches tall every word had to be like at least two inches bold-faced mm -hmm. like and usually they're troubleshooting like you said they're troubleshooting these issues for themselves because mm -hmm. people don't think to take care of it for them and I'm saying hey small business owners you know even larger business owners you can set yourself up for success and help these people and do good by helping these people um you know manage these things for them but they just don't know how. Okay. So what's your process been like in terms of like attaining clients? Yeah, it's been a lot of outreach trying to find the small business owners who have a passion for wanting to give back and actually do good because those people already have a big heart, right? They have a big heart for wanting to do good and they have the desire to kind of set things up right is what I've found like. So it's been a lot of outreach and creating relationships and at the end of the day, the relationship building part is key for me. So I'm online trying to, you know, talk to people via social media and uh, through referrals and through just different people mm -hmm. so that I can find the people who want to actually take the time to set their site up for success and help these people. So one of my concerns that I have for your business right now Again, things go wrong live. The microphone just fell, so. <laughs> um, Quite all right. Yeah, um, that's the way I kind of like things too. So yep. we'll just that. Um, one of the issues that I've always seen too, um, especially with this kind of service with website design, there's so many people who did it seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years ago. And now mm -hmm. that it's checked off their list, they have a yep. very tough time spending any money on it. Oh, yes. That yep. is a very, like, how have you been able to overcome that? I have been able to overcome that by talking to them about changes to come. You know, the big, the big topic as of late are algorithms. Everything from social media algorithms and to my world, which is the Google algorithm, search algorithms. It's going to be changing very drastically by the end of the year too because of all the HUD yes. things that came out. 
Yep, you got it. And there's going to be another drastic change in 2021 that accounts for page experience. And that is essentially user experience design, um, using the good quality practices to help uh, a user that shows up on your page, you know, have a good experience, get from point A to point B in a quick, manageable fashion. So they're going to look at page speed and how they're engaging on your site. And so talking to people about these changes to come and saying, I don't know how your website will essentially rank now based off of this new component of the algorithm. So talking to them about that and how big of a role accessibility is going to take. So do you have a tool that you use in order to show how user friendly their, uh, uh, their website is? So there's a lot of UX research methods that we can go into. Um, there's a lot of you know, you can do heat mapping, you can do where eye tracking, where you can actually see where the user is experiencing things on your web, how they jump from a picture to a button and back to the navigation or, you know, up and down the page, which is amazing to watch. It's a lot of fun. But, you know, beyond that, there's also accessibility tools that can allow you to check things like colors. Um, how does this color work on this color background with this font or this weight? So there are so many free tools out there for people to check these things on their own. They just don't know about them. The one that I'm thinking of in particular um, is DIB, D-I-I-B. Have you used that one before? I don't think so. I haven't okay. used that one very much, but would you tell it, me more about that one. It's not one that I've used a ton, but it's one that mm -hmm. I've come across and I've started digging into and then got pulled away on other things. Yeah. Um, but it will do what it will do is actually go through your website in real time and check all these factors and give them a score. Yeah, there you go. That can work. I, I can see a tool like that working very well for you as a qualifier. Mm -hmm. um, I love that show something like, Hey, I don't own this software. This is somebody completely third party. Um, but as yeah. part of your sales process, you can set that up for them and they could see, Hey, your mobile responsiveness isn't what it should be. Yes. I love that because that, are, those are the things that I check manually, <laughs> Yes, you know, I check manually through these things and I've just always learned known to do those things, but now that there's a service to do it, it's fantastic because it gives us a baseline, right? Exactly. And, and it's something yep. that you can do. And even in your sales process, it's something, hey, I'll give you the tool, take a look at this. And you can do yeah. it right during an initial phone call pretty easily. Mm -hmm. I um, love that. That's something now, I don't know if that tool is up to your standards because I'm mm -hmm. a bit of a novice when it comes to a lot of these things. Hey, it's amazing that you're aware of it. Like a lot of people aren't even aware of things like experience. But well, that's aware of it. It's, it's like being aware of the knocking in the engine. I'm going to give myself that much credit. Like I, I yeah. know the engine is making a noise. Mm -hmm. I see the little uh, check engine light on there. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, on a car, I'm pretty good. But on yeah. websites and technology, I'm still mm -hmm. a Neanderthal. Yeah, and it's hard to take that information and say, well, what do I do with this now? Well, how do I how do I make the changes? And you know, that's a lot of the there's a lot of UX user experience um, softwares out there that will do things like, you know, analytics and you know, even Google Analytics, pulling all this number and data, but then how do you apply the data to the design and actually make implementable changes? And that's something specific with Google Analytics that even I've had a problem with. Like mm -hmm. I can pull up what, like how many page views a web search has, like how many mm -hmm. people are searching for how to sell. Yeah. But that doesn't mean like what target, what size do you want to go after? What keyword, mm -hmm. like if it's too big, then nobody's going to end up there. Mm -hmm. So how much of a search do you really want to find? Mm -hmm. And what do you want to do with the data that you found? How do you handle it? How do you implement it? How do you apply it to your business? And that is a massive, massive undertaking. Like it's mm -hmm. like Google Daunting. alone has changed so much. Like it's not just backlinks anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's constantly changing. It is constantly changing and updating and keeping things relevant and fresh, if you will. But the, the it affects us. Metaphor or simile, I don't remember which is which anymore. It's I'm so <laughs> far out of high school. The metaphor slash simile that I use is it's an arms race. Marketers uh -huh. figure it out, 
Google changes, marketers figure it out, Google changes, yep. and it's going to be like that in perpetuity until one of them die off. And it's probably exactly. not going to be, well, it may not even be marketers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I think it's funny you say that because that's what's, that's what I tried to teach my coaching clients is iteration is key. You can't just set it and forget it. You can't just you know, design something miraculous that works for one person and think that they're never going to change because your dream clients change, your people change, your audience changes a lot within the span of a quarter. So I'm always telling my coaching clients, you know, you have to make changes every quarter, you know, whether it's to the copy, to the images, try to see what works best and because Google's always watching. So I, I kind of want to bounce this off of you too, because it's a problem that I've seen with a lot of business owners. Um, mm -hmm. and, and as I've been doing more coaching, more consulting, um, I've been doing real estate consulting for the last two years. Awesome. Yeah. Um, but when I ask people, who is your ideal customer? Mm -hmm. Well, I can help everyone. Terrible answer. Terrible answer. Terrible. Like I could help yes. everyone. Oh, oh, okay. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's the idea of you don't want to be Toyota. Toyota is too vanilla. Nobody's excited about Toyota. You want to be Tesla. Yes. Yes. How do you approach that with people? How, how do you have that conversation? It's like, well, you're right, but you're still mm -hmm. wrong. <laughs> you know, it's hard. It's really starting out with developing in them an empathetic mindset. We need them to start thinking about their user, their ideal clients in a more empathetic way where they're actually connecting with them and making natural connections. And so I'm always encouraging them to push the envelope, to dig a little deeper. And I actually walk them through my um, dream client blueprint, which is essentially a uh, a persona, a profile that we create together of a very specific person that they can constantly refer to in their business and, you know, start referring to them as a specific name. You know, what would Sarah want in this, in this decision? Mm -hmm. How, That's how can I help Sarah? I have Ryan and I have Jess. Yes, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> like that is what you need. And I have those two different mm -hmm. personas laid out. Um, mm -hmm. And quite frankly, you're pretty much spot on for my Jess character. Like, Great. <laughs> like a small business owner, super bright, super smart. You're technical, but it's a matter of how do we translate this into business now? Yes, exactly. And for me, it's guiding them. Okay, you have your persona, you have your person. Now let's look at their journey. Let's, let's empathize with their journey and take a step into their shoes and figure out what they actually need before we make decisions on anything. So before we touch anything technical, I'm talking to them about this empathetic mindset. Um, my empath method is what I call it because it's so important for us to develop that empathetic mindset before we make any critical de business decisions. Yes. Um, what I also want to ask about, so mm -hmm. it sounds like it, at least the way this conversation has been going, and I could be reading mm -hmm. it wrong, how much of your business is focused primarily on website design? I mean, it's like me doing the design or coaching the design or? Doing coaching, like how, however you, you set that up. Um, yeah. I mean, everything kind of everything kind of encompasses the web design process, right? So it's um, the beginning to the end of web design, and I'm coaching people um, on it or doing it for them. It really depends on what path they want to take. I find that a lot of small business owners that you know um, I talk with are lifelong learners and they want to learn how to do it right so that they can maintain it for themselves in the future. You know, they, they pay for a fancy web developer and a designer, and then they don't touch it for five years like we were talking about because they don't know how to. So I want to empower them to be able to do it on their own. So that's where my coaching comes in and et cetera. And how do you balance that sale with, so I know for me, I talk to people often about doing things specifically more social media related as opposed to mm -hmm. website related. The problem is I'm going to teach them something that's going to be obsolete in 18 to 24 months in many cases. Mm -hmm. So you probably want to funnel them more into the website coaching as opposed to the website design because it's a recurring revenue model for you. 
Absolutely. Coaching is where I want to be coaching, not only because it is, it benefits me for the long term, you know, for revenue wise, but it's because of the relationships that I'm building with these people. I truly want to see their causes do well. And I truly want to see them do good online and do good in the world. And um, it's important for me to develop a relationship and kind of continue it through continued maintenance. So we get you set up, right? We lay the foundation, right? Together at the very beginning. And then I'm maintaining it with them on a quarter to quarter basis or on a month to month basis of little improvements that they can make so that they can continue to adhere to algorithm changes, Google changes, you name it. Okay. So and get the best out of it. So now I kind of want to go into your ideal customers now, because yeah. that's where you, it's not like you have a ba- database. It's not like you have a BNI group that you can go to. Um, nope. What, at least none that I know of. Um, how are you finding your clients? Are you looking for a 501? What is it? I forgot if it's 501. 501c3. <laughs> yeah, I would, forgot if it was 501c or 503c. It just, uh, yeah. You know, it really, I yes, I do utilize some of those businesses that are certified under those kind of terms, but I'm also just getting in Facebook groups, to be honest with you, um, to find out what businesses are doing to give back and identify the people who are already giving back and doing good. So I have already talked to, you know, hundreds of people that are, have such unique causes and they're so passionate about wanting to talk to them. Everything from, you know, um, human trafficking to uh, there's, you know, supporting animal foundations and clean water initiatives. So it's very interesting to hear what people's passions are about these causes. And I'm just openly asking them in Facebook groups so I can start connecting with them there. But I'm also looking into certified um, certifications that they can get that actually qualify them as a, um, as a company that does good. Uh, there's a couple of them out there that I I'm, I'm can't grasp on the top of my head, but okay. um because that was going to be my follow-up because I'm like, okay, yes. now, now how do we go and get those? But yes. like, I, I couldn't think of them right now. Like, so it's not quite a nonprofit, but it is a, mm-hmm. a th- these are good dudes. Yes, they're, they are, they have been certified to actually, that they are actually giving their money and giving a portion of their business funds or products oh. to, you know, charities and organizations. Yes. I know this one too. Damn. I know it's driving me nuts. And I'm just like, damn, no, I, I know the exact, it, it's qu- kind of like a hybrid nonprofit uh, model, but it hybrid is. profit, nonprofit model. It's something that's really become popular. I know specifically like you're in Colorado, correct? Yes, I am I, in Colorado. I thought Colorado was like one of the first to roll that like classification out, if I remember correctly. I, there might be a few of them, but I, I did find one of them. It is called the Benefit Corporation for Good. Yeah. And you can get certified through them um, as, you know, a company who is actually, you know, giving to the greater good. Um, and so I'm utilizing those kinds of companies that we, yes, like you just talked about. I'm not sure if this one's out of Colorado or not, but. But, but I've heard Benefit Corporations. Like I've yeah. heard that term before and sadly that's not a name that sticks in your head. Like it, it's weird it that isn't. that doesn't stick in your head but the 501c3 does. It does, I know. Like I think oh, that that's the more common term. Yeah, but. So the, and it's it, something that, you know, people have to get, go through the ringer a little bit to get a 501c3 certification. Whereas these corporations, um, you know, the, benefit corporations for good, for example, they are just recognizing businesses that are doing good rather than, you know, because with 501c3s, I think you get a lot more tax benefits and stuff. Absolutely. But to be in the model that this is emulating is say like the Toms of the world. Yes, yes, Yes. exactly. The Toms of the world are the people that I want to be working with, the people who are giving up their products and have that big heart, but maybe just a little bit on the smaller scale. I want to help the smaller people. Um, And especially with this pandemic, you know, it's amazing the amount of people who are doing good right now. Yeah. Okay. So the problem I'm hearing is that you're, in order to find customers, it's very, very legwork heavy. 
Absolutely. Lots of legwork, lots really of outreach, like relationship building right now. I, what you're going to want to do more than anything is find a way that can, like, you're basically cold calling for a lot of this. Mm-hmm. And that is a lot. Um, we yes. need to figure out a way to bring people to you as opposed to you go to them. Hey, I love that idea. Give me anything you got. <laughs> so I've never tried something like this before and I've never seen somebody do it specifically. Yeah. But my mind is going to TEDx. Yes. I love all the TED, TED things, TED everything. <laughs> well, and TEDx for our local. But that's something that I think you can start doing for mm -hmm. a credibility standard perspective, um, something where you can be giving back and helping people give their information, and it can be a corralling station for you to bring your ideal clients in. Because Absolutely. I remember watching an excellent TED Talk specifically on human trafficking. Yep. See? Um, like I can't, I, I'll never remember her name, but I remember like, I remember the visual. I don't remember her name right now um, sure. but talking about how like massage parlors wind up being human trafficking arenas and all mm -hmm. of that stuff. Those kinds of talks, letting people who are really excited about getting their message out there and giving them mm -hmm. a platform for it, that yes. will draw people to you. Isn't there a slogan like um, ideas for spreading good or, you know, ideas for doing good in the world? I don't know, but I, I agree. This is a platform that is already wanting to spread these kinds of ideas of good in the world. So now what you do is you start organ, like if you could organize those events, it's yeah. a very easy ask of, hey, I saw that you're doing this. Mm -hmm would you like to be on stage? And now once you have them there in like one-on-one, -on -one, so how are you promoting the business? How are you doing this? How are you doing that? That's an easier conversation to make once mm -hmm. you've given them that platform. Um, Absolutely. I just listened to a book, Stephen Wolfner, I believe the name is, W-O-E-F-F-N-E-R. I could be mis mispronouncing a name. He, he's hosts a very successful podcast and that's the way mm -hmm. he gets his clients. Amazing. What he does is he invites the people he wants to work with on his podcast Yeah. to give them the ability to sell their platform. And then mm -hmm. he tries to sell them afterwards once they've had that hour conversation and they had all of that. Of course. Now, that's actually similar to something that I'm trying to do right now via Facebook groups, actually. Absolutely. Is yeah, bringing people together in just the same space and then featuring featuring them within the group of this is how somebody's already doing good. And, and that is a great way to do it. But the problem is you have to, like you haven't, them in. The, yeah, you haven't <laughs> built the group enough yet. That's something yeah. you're going to want to do. Um, but you do TEDx Colorado Springs and you start becoming the figurehead for that. Yes, I love that. That is a direction that I think you can go very easily. If you can't, because now you're stealing their credibility a little bit, giving it to yourself, mm -hmm. you can probably do it quarterly. Mm -hmm. And that's all you really need. Yeah, I love that idea. Do you uh, guys have um, creative mornings mm -hmm. in your area? I've never heard of that one before, but it's, you know, it is very much um, for the design community. That's why I feel like a lot of people don't know very much about it, but it's bringing, um, you know, creative people together and getting them to mastermind around um, their ideas and what they do. And um, it's all, it's a nationwide kind of networking uh, group, if you will. And everybody's always focused on uh, one theme, but they get speakers from their area to come in and talk about that one theme. So whether it's inclusivity, you know, um, scarcity, or, you know, it, it's a broad themes, which is amazing. And everybody talks about it differently. It and reminds that's me a lot of that You can start doing very well. And that gives you a better in than, hey, your website's crap. Yes. Exactly. It's the authentic relationships that I'm looking for. I just need a playground for, to actually bring our ideas and minds together. Because this, the path you're on now is going to lead to burnout because yeah. it, and my, I, so I'm going to give you my read. Um, you're probably an introvert. You're, you're yeah. a high C personality. 
I'm definitely an introvert that um, went to broadcast news school actually and learned how to talk to people. Yeah. So <laughs> that's how um, my path has taken me to get to here. So because I'm an introvert too, I know the cold calling model is going mm -hmm. to turn you out sooner or longer rather than later. Yes. So we have to figure out a way to get you off of that path. Now there's probably a couple of ways to do that. Mm -hmm. One is you subcontract it out. You hire what, like an ISA for it. Mm -hmm. But you still want them to be efficient enough to be able to offer something of value to that business. Hey, I want to give you a platform where you can promote what, you, what you're doing. Yes. Um, that's, that's where you want to get eventually is have somebody who can just bulldoze through a phone list because you're not going to want to. Mm-hmm. And it, get me to the point of being ready to make those relationships because, you know, there is a big party that still wants to have the relationship absolutely. and to create deeper, meaningful relationships. That's the misnomer that so many people have with introverts is that introverts don't mm -hmm. want relationships. No, we just want fewer, fewer, deeper relationships. We want a well quality, model. quality over quantity. Yes. Um, but the problem is you've built your business around the idea of quantity, quantity, quantity right now. And yep, out and outreach. Yep. And as a small business owner, I feel like, you know, it's all the hustle mentality. It's all of that where we, that's a whole nother topic that you and I could dive into. Drastically. So <laughs> I work with um, Jared James Enterprises. That's one of the top real estate uh, coaching companies in uh, the country. Cool. He has what he calls hustle redefined. So yes, you work hard, but you also set up time where you're hustling to like hang out with your kids, spend time with your wife. You're doing like, you're going to the gym. Like, yes, yes, you hustle, but you have a set amount of time where that's focused on. Exactly. And that is so, so important to me. Um, my better me doing good for myself. Um, and I've, I, you know, I think I've had that falling moment um, before before launching my business, thank goodness, but where I was sleeping in the office. Hmm. And, it, 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 you know, you realize really fast, even though I was working for a really amazing university as a director of operations at the time, mm -hmm. when you get all the cool gear and Nike stuff through the athletic program, but when you're using it as a blanket, <laughs> that's not as fun. No, no, it is not. So uh, the hustle, the burnout, I'm very aware of that. And the balance, balance has been key for me in my mindset. And it means a lot of, a little bit of sacrifices too. So I love the idea that you're telling me, you know, let's find ways to make sure you don't burn out. Let's bring people to you. Yeah. Um, figuring it out in a way where more phone calls is not a scalable model. It just mm -hmm. is um, more outreach is not a scalable model because depending on the way your coaching is set up, you're probably going to have drop off after a period of time. If you have a mm -hmm. six month coaching commitment, most probably 50% of your clients are gone month seven. Yes. It's very hard. And it's very hard to, when they see the pretty website, they, when they see everything functioning properly, they think, oh, I don't have to do it anymore. I don't have to, that's done. Check, you know, H have you figured so what does your coaching program look like? Like, how does that actually work right now? Absolutely. So the very, the first phase, if you will, so the first three weeks, we talk a lot about mindset and getting really clear on who your person is um, so that you can make the critical decisions for later. So like we were talking about earlier about developing that empathy mindset so that you are very strategic with your decisions, which will come in phase two. Phase two is really when you kind of deep dive into the technical side of things, um, creating functionality and functional websites before they even look pretty. So yeah. we're talking about flows and everything in black and white, if you will, literally black and white designs yeah. Um, yeah, before you, you even apply branding. Yet. No, you don't because that's a distraction. Yes. And that's usually when I lose a lot of clients and customers is because they get distracted by the branding and the look pretty, but you don't know if it actually functions properly. You're not setting it up to be accessible or a good experience for people. 
Um, so, you know, it's taking those steps to really go through it appropriately. That's the main core of it is that I'm guiding people through that process and helping them. We're co-creating is what I like to say, because I want to empower them to be able to create and maintain it themselves eventually, but they love the, they love the guidance as well. They want to be told what things are right or to get feedback. And then the last two or three weeks of the program, because it's a 12 week program, um, is iteration and learning how to iterate and make changes to the site in the future, how to get the data that you need um, and what to do with that data to continue making changes. Mm. The problem is once you've hit that week 12, like there's not much to do week 13 other than maintenance, as long as they did all their homework behind the scenes. Maintenance, yes. There's a lot of maintenance and there's you know, there's a lot of design iteration that they can be implementing on their own to see what works better. So just as, you know, somebody with sales wants to try out a couple different pitches, you want to try maybe an image that works differently. So I encourage a lot of A-B testing and, um, you know, routes to take from the UX perspective for research that, you know, will maybe start drawing in new people and new leads and constantly informing themselves of design changes that can make a difference in their sales. Okay and the Google algorithm. So we need to get something because my read on it is it's supposed to be set up and ready to go in 12 months they, or in 12 weeks. They're mm -hmm. ready to check out week 13, no matter what, like that's the hotel state of them, the way that Basically. everything is set up right now. Yes. We need to come up with a model where you can stay in front of them after week 12 on a consistent basis, kind of like a hold program. Sure. Yes. The uh, maintenance program for it afterwards. What I'm thinking of is either a monthly or quarterly checkup. Yeah. So, audit. Like, or Like, do you, you know. have a specific audit program like that in place that you have where it's you once every X number of months, go through and check everything. I've just started kind of thinking about what does that look like from a maintenance perspective and how can I stay engaged with them? And the biggest thoughts that I've had thus far is helping them continue to understand their Google Analytics um, and understand the data. And if we get programs such as the heat mapping or eye tracking that I've talked to you about before, being their consultant at this point to read that data and tell them implementable steps that they can do on their sites because I'm already very familiar with it because I've helped them lay the foundation that and who they are right I understand yep. their brand their values etc um, to make changes that might help with their sales process so that's as far as I've gotten thus far as far as the maintenance side goes but I, I think to figure out something where I think this is something that you do automatically as an ad for the first two, like first two sessions, the first two checkup sessions are yeah. included in your 12 week coaching. I love that. Yes. Um, after that, it, whether that's quarterly, whether that's annually, whether it's whatever, you get two checkups at predefined times. I love that idea because it gives them an idea of what, what's to come and why they need to make changes couple months after, you know, it, and especially, and you can literally let them know, just like I'm sure you are, Google is constantly going to be changing. So yes. you'll go through the 12 weeks. That's going to take three months. And then three months mm -hmm. after that, I'm going to do a follow-up three months after that, I'm going to do a follow-up. And then you can sell, Hey, if we want to continue either the maintenance or we need to rebuild everything because Google's just played 52 pickup and thrown all their cards <laughs> in the air. Um, yes. It's something you can easily do. Um, three months is probably the longest I would try to stretch that out. I totally agree. I would say, you know, shorter than that, I would maybe even break it down into just, you know, maybe six weeks. I do my first checkup of That's some sort, you know, works better. Uh, mm -hmm. You want it to be a long enough period of time where it's possible that something can change. Yes. And I was just thinking the exact same thing. I need enough time to get enough data to, you know, enough sample size to actually say this is making a difference and we need to update this. Yeah. Um, or double down on the P PPC ad for that specific page because that page is going really mm -hmm. well. Um, 
but I would kind of up your program from 12 weeks to 14 calls. It's very front heavy, but then there's a maintenance behind it. Or 15 I love that, calls. yeah. Um, that way you have the opportunity con to continue the relationship. Yes, I love that idea. I also love that idea because there's always new compliance and regulations that are coming out about the web. For instance, a couple of years ago, GDPR hit and it was a mad shuffle uh, for everybody online to make sure that they were GDPR compliant. But, you know, that's another value of the maintenance is that I will guide you through those kinds of situations. And I mean, from a marketing standpoint, I'd probably point towards 15 calls total. Mm hmm. Because it, it sounds a little more than 14, like 14, like, I, I don't know. <laughs> it <why>. does. <laughs> it's like uh, something like from a marketing, although that could work yeah. too. Like the, having that odd number to grab there. Why 14? Like 12 makes sense. 14, like 15 kind True. of makes sense. So grabs your attention. I could go in that direction too, but you need to have something where you're able to follow up with them because most people who start businesses start multiple businesses. Yeah. That's so true. That's just the entrepreneurial lifestyle now is kind of becoming a serial entrepreneur because entrepreneurs are known to be the idea man, the people yeah. that have a lot of amazing, cool ideas, but sometimes the, don't know exactly what to do to get there. The entrepreneurial seizure, Michael, Michael Gerber calls it. Yes, there you go. Thank you. I was like, what was what is it that you called it earlier? Yeah, the entrepreneur. It's a technician who has an entrepreneurial seizure who wants like they're really good at something. They're good at mm -hmm. in his book. He's Sarah, which was the name you said before. Yes, <laughs> Sarah was an excellent baker. She kept being told you need to start a business. You need to start a business. Mm -hmm. So she did. And now she's working 20 hours a day making pies and she doesn't want to look at another pie ever again. Yep. Yep. What would we do to help Sarah? How can we help Sarah? So, so that going to that 14 program, mm -hmm. I think would help you in two different ways. One, it'll help you stay in front of them because when you're talking to them initially, all they're thinking about is I need my website. I need my website. I need my website. Mm -hmm. Gives you the opportunity to follow up with them, set it up where you can talk to them in a more like laid back manner where you're not yes. giving them as much homework to it. There is. And I find that a lot of like courses and programs like this right now, it's like you're speeding through the program to some extent without any breathing room. No. And I like the idea of adding in the breathing room at the end to kind of say, hey, let's process what we've learned and let me help you do that. I'm a big fan of, from a coaching standpoint, the four disciplines of execution, if you've ever read it. No, tell me more. I love all the books you have. You should have a big bookcase behind you because you're like a librarian. <laughs> no, because they're all audio books and I don't pay for it. <laughs> Good old Kindle. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. To just have an iPod here, like just taped up with duct tape. Like, yes, um, there you go. But the idea of the four disciplines of execution is you can only do one thing at a time. Multitasking mm -hmm. is myth. So you have to start by figuring out what the wildly important goal is. Mm-hmm. Then it's about figuring out the lead measures versus the lag measures, creating the culture of accountability, all those different things. Um, mm -hmm. Oh no, set up the scoreboard culture of accountability. Those are the four. So WIG, um, lead versus lag, scoreboard, culture of accountability. Awesome. Um, that's the way most coaching programs should be set up. If mm -hmm. you give them everything you know, like, hey, let's not do 12 weeks. Let's do 12 hours. We'll just get it all done in a day. It's impossible. It's like information overload, information paralysis, if you will. Yeah. No, um, you need to make sure that you spend the time to slow it down with them. Mm -hmm. Especially with these technical topics. Very much so, because yeah. that is not, nobody got into being an entrepreneur. Like I didn't get into helping people with sales to be a content creator, but mm -hmm. I need to be a content creator in order to help people with their sales. Yes. We all have to wear a lot of different hats. I talk a lot about that in my entrepreneurial journey is the, you know, I have to wear the accounting hat, the sales hat, the UX hat. Yes. It's never ending. And I feel like they just kind of like keep on growing on top of my head. Yes. And have you looked for help with any of that? As far as like business coach? Well, not a business coach. I, I'm literally talking about like who, what can you outs outsource to? Oh, whether outsourcing? It's, whether it's a little bit. to another person, a virtual assistant, um, whether it is 
like it doesn't have to be like or just hiring somebody in person I, I don't know what your cash flows are like but mm-hmm. I'm hearing a lot of burnout already <laughs> you know it's I have not asked for help yet I'll be the first to say that I um, I'm not good at asking for help but Stop. I've considered it, you know, and from, from a cash flow perspective post COVID right now and working off PPP loans and all the things, you know, to kind of help maintain and sustain um, with, you know, few engagements and such just because that's where our world is right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a little bit harder, but it's not something that I would completely disregard for the future because I would love to be able to spend time with my future child um, a little bit more often because you're especially because my wife is like breastfeeding too so she's not only a full-time worker she's also a refrigerator yes (laughs) isn't Um, that hilarious yeah yes um you're going to need some help it doesn't Mm -hmm. have to be like you can outsource if not the initial reach out you could outsource the research for the reach out very, very I love true. that. Um, that's so- where do you recommend that I find quality help though? Quality help, like the I haven't gone into those as much lately. Um, mm-hmm. the book that I'm listening to right now is The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. Mm, yes, quality one. Um, the company that he's recommended a few times in there, I believe it was called Brickwork. I think that sounds familiar. I listened to it on audiobook a while back. Yeah. Um, I believe Brickwork is the company that he mentions, and it's a lot of people, I believe, in Bangalore, but Mm -hmm. they don't need to be reaching out to your client, but they can research. They can Mm -hmm. set them up for 15, 20 hours a week of, hey, who should I be calling? What do I need to know about them? Mm -hmm. I love that idea. And, you know, as I was telling you earlier, being an expecting mother, this is only going to become more real for me. This is only going to become I, I quit my full-time job so that I could be a stay-at-home mom and still contribute to my family income to mm-hmm. s- contribute. I don't foresee myself being the breadwinner, but I want to contribute to the family income and allow my creative juices to flow and to help other people. But there is a limit. Yeah. And, I can only do so much. The worst thing that could happen for you as it stands right now is for you to get wildly successful. Yes. I like that. (laughs) I like that that idea. (laughs) Because you don't have the processes in place. You don't have the structure in place right now to expand your business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm Uh, very much in the building stage of the systems and processes phase. And that takes a lot of footwork, you know, and especially because I'm so driven towards creating relationships, it drives me to want to do it all myself. Um, But there are workarounds. Yeah, you still can. But figure out somebody who could introduce you first. Yeah. That might be the direction to start with um, because I, I don't see you being able to do it the way you are long-term. I agree with that. Um, especially with if that. you've got a screaming four-month-old in the background. I totally agree with that. And it's so funny because I already have space set in my office for the yeah four month old that will be hanging out with me. And that's the way my wife, like we have her, she's still working from home, luckily. Mm -hmm. Goodness, good. And and she's in literally set up in the baby's room in one corner, the cribs in the other corner. Mm -hmm. It's it just, that's life. Life happens. Yeah. um, But we have to do it and make things and we have to do it now because if you're having the baby, you said in March before, right? Yes, March. Okay. So you've got really three months to nail all of this down Mm -hmm. because once the baby is here, you're not going to have the time to experiment and see what works. Exactly. Exactly Uh, why I've been hustling and doing the legwork now, but we need to involve more systems and processes and different avenues to help prevent the burnout. Yeah. I agree with you. So the process... The way that I would do is first, I think you should look into some help. It's going to take you some time to find the right person and train them the right way. Um, mm-hmm. that, that would be action item number one. Mm-hmm. It could be a virtual ISA. It can be a whatever. Um, but like ISA inside sales agent, like internet yes. sales, whatever. Um, just to, in case people didn't know. Thank you. 
we also need to figure out a strategy where people are coming to you and where you're able to give them a platform. Mm -hmm. Facebook groups is a good start, but I think you need to think bigger. Yeah. I love the idea with TEDx, like you mentioned. Yeah, um, Great that, that's something. And your very first people you reach out to are your clients that are active, like whether they're active or not, or you want to just bring them into the fold. Hey, you're doing yeah. such good work with blank. Mm -hmm. Let's dial it up. Um, that would probably be the next one. Um, yeah, that, that's, and then actually, and then just tweaking the contract where it's the 14 calls instead of the 12. Yeah, I really love that idea because it leads very well into the maintenance phase and giving people more time to digest this very technical thing that we're doing. So I love it, those ideas. And then what you can do is you can set it up where it's follow up every three months, every six months, every, like that follow up is a specific product of that they can just reach out to like, hey, I think something's up with my website. Maybe something changed in the background that they didn't know about. Yes. My, my or hey, I'm not getting as much reach as I used to. Uh -huh. Not getting as much engagement as I used to. What's going on? But but it can be something that you can sell for $250, let's just say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you website know? audits. Yeah, just one-time audits or like a continuing like, hey, if you sign up for a year of them, we'll give you mm -hmm. a discount rather than two fifty. It'd be one seventy-five. Let's just say, yeah, per one. But or you do one time two forty-nine out the door, and you'll because I know how labor intensive that's going to be. Mm -hmm. And because I'm very <laughs> detail oriented and want to want to do my best and show up for everybody at the best I can. You're you nailed me. Yeah. Um, so those are the three things I would work on. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. the, the outsource, the, um, the lead funnel, so to speak, with TEDx mm -hmm. or some mm -hmm. similar like um, the, the breakfast, the, the, the what was it? The creative mornings. Yes. Yep. But one of those where you can give them a platform to talk. Mm -hmm. that's going to be a big one. Um, that one's going to take the longest to actually start building and implementing. Mm -hmm. the, the two fastest are your adjust the product, find help. Yes. If you need that before the baby's there though. I, yep. I, you know, where are we at here? We are November. So like you said, we got about three months since it's going to be hustling, but because joy it when baby be comes. set up before like the like you need more than a month to make sure it's all in maintenance programs that mm -hmm. what what could go wrong did because you don't want to be my wife had a 30 hour labor so you don't want things oh to be going God. wrong then oh uh, god bless her <laughs> yeah oh, she was just hours. laying there <laughs> Hopefully no pain, epidural, something along those lines. <laughs> uh, they gave her the epidural and the epidural wore off. Oh no. Yeah. So and not, not don't to jinx scare me, you. please. <laughs> no, don't, not to scare you, but yeah, it, not so much for the labor pain. She had a um, back pain. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. She messed up her back. She worked at Amazon uh, years ago and mm -hmm. messed up one of the discs in her back and the baby was Thanks. just like karate chopping that disc. I'm pretty sure I broke my mom's tailbone when I was born, so. <laughs> so side note, um, my, I was born in 86 before doctors did like, oh, we'll induce labor. No, when the baby's ready to come out, the baby comes out. I was, so I was supposed to be due in June. I don't know the date okay. I was supposed to be due in June. I was born July 28th. <gasps> Oh my goodness. You took your sweet old time. I was over 10 pounds. Oh my goodness. And I broke one of my mom's ribs with kicking. Wow. Yeah. You were ferocious. Yeah. She, she, she never quite forgave me for that. Like on my birthday, she'd slap me in the back of the head. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for breaking my rib, honey. Yeah, exactly. Just whack. Turn yep. the ring around first, the whole nine. <laughs> Yep. You know, my husband, his youngest brother was actually a 10 pound baby as well. So I'm like, I just hope I, you know, we don't get any of those uh, yeah. big babies coming at me. And I'm the small one in my family. <laughs> How like, many I'm, did your mother have? <laughs> well, so it's just two. It's me and my brother. Okay, good. So, but it's like, I can't do another 10 pound baby. I mean, overall with, um, 
like my whole family, like most of them are six two, six three, six five. Wow. I, wow. I'm five eleven, but you know, like like I'm 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 the runt of the litter at five eleven, two seventy. Oh my gosh. And yeah. being a ten pound baby. Just yeah. you know, so. that was a month overdue. Yeah. No, <laughs> Probably. It, like, uh, again, if that happens, you never have to forgive forgive the child. I'm just going to tell you that because she never <laughs> she never forgave you, huh? <laughs> Every birthday got the slap in the head. <laughs> uh, it, like like turn the ring around first. And slap. <laughs> I'm gonna make sure he feels this, just like I felt that rib. Yep. So, but I think we've got some good options for you. I'm excited. I'm excited to start implementing some of these. So thank you so much. Like I, the biggest thing that's going to hold you back and the thing I think you might like if any of these, I think you're going to fight doing, it's going to be finding help. <laughs> you know me well, you promise know me well. You, you will actually give it like a real try. I promise like, I will go and look for, for some... at least two months. Yes. Yes. Um, like I would say reread um, the Tim Ferriss, the four hour work week first. Because yeah. it's really in depth in terms of what problems you could come across. I agree. And I'm at a totally different stage of life now where a lot of that's going to be a little bit more applicable now. So I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Um, but I would do that and then reach out to company. I want to say it's Brickwork. And I know he mentioned another yeah. one, it was more of a personal VA. Cool. Okay. I, I just remember the idea of him outsourcing the fight to his like fight that he was having with his wife. And I just love that story. <laughs> like him and his oh, wife. That was such a good one. <laughs> like he's like, oh, well, Anjit could call her. Like she he, send her the email and I don't make me deal with it. <laughs> I don't want to deal with this right now. No, <laughs> exactly. Like, no, talk that, to my assistant, darling. <laughs> but when you go to your husband and he's like, no, nah, I'm not in the mood for this fight here. Here's Anjit. Well, talk to her. <laughs> yep. It's so great. Yeah. It was a very good book. I'm excited yeah. to reread it. Mm. Yeah. Um, but commit to doing it because you're not going to have the time to do it when you most need it. And I yes. don't want you to be underwater when you're trying to put something in place because that's not fair to whoever you hire either. I totally agree with that. And I'm all about delivering quality. So that's, it's got to be a part of the, the baby steps that I'm taking now to make sure that I'm setting them up for success. All right. But I think we covered a lot of great things. Um, if people want to get a hold of you, they want to get some help with their website, where do they reach out? How do they find you? Yeah, you can absolutely find me at my website, nataliejark.com. So N-A-T-A-L-I-E-J-A-R-K.com. Um, and you can also find me in my Facebook group that we were talking about earlier, the Doing Good Online Facebook group, where we're rallying together all the small business owners who love giving back and doing good. And I'll be sharing a lot of, you know, website tips and tricks on there to make your website more engaging through, um, through there. So probably the best two places you can find me right now. Awesome. Well, I, I, I enjoyed this conversation, like your yeah. real peoples, which I love. Thank you. So are like, you. I love having these candid conversations. Yeah, it, it's, it's always, and I, I'm lucky that I haven't encountered it yet with anybody I've spoken to, but I always hate talking to the professional business coach. Yeah, no, no, I don't no, follow those stop, rules. Stop trying to be perfect. You're boring us. Yes. Perfect is, it's more fun being imperfect anyways. Yeah. People like the Kardashians. They don't like their like their, <laughs> their 9 a.m. morning news person with their quaffed hair and their cup of coffee. And so funny because I almost became one of those. So no, yeah, that's a story that for another day. Right for <laughs> no, it was not. No, no, no it was not. not. Um, but thank you so much for being on. I loved this conversation. It was great. Yes. Um, again, once, once again, everybody who's listening, this has been the Broken Salespeople podcast. Um, if you'd like to find me, brokensalespeople.com slash connect. Um, you can find me on all the platforms there. You can also find um, my blogs, my podcasts, all of that stuff, brokensalespeople.com, brokensalespeople.com slash connect. Um, until next time, um, and like work on yourself and um, go fix yourself. <laughs>